State law protects Utahns from excess pollution, unsafe conditions, and more, and the Attorney General's office helps enforce those rules. Hello, I'm Richard Pyatt, and this is Legally Speaking. When it comes to preserving safe, healthy air, water, and land, the Division of Environmental Quality has a big job. Most of the time, any violation of the rules is caught, noted, and remedied quickly. But when it keeps happening, if it keeps happening, that's when the legal process starts and the AG's office gets involved. The process is an interesting one, and a lengthy one, too, and we're learning more about it today from Marina Thomas, Director of our Environmental Section. Marina oversees air quality specifically, but the process is the same for water, radiation control, drinking water, and hazardous waste. Correct, Marina? That is right. Um, And each of those divisions has a process that is pretty similar, and we're trying to keep it similar so that all the violators are subject to the same rules. So I think a lot of people are interested in this topic because we all care about the environment. And if something's doing, somebody's doing something wrong, if a company's doing something wrong or an, even an individual, then they, they want it to be remedied quickly. So would you say that um, this is an important process that we have in place? Yes, I think it's uh, very important for, first of all, our health, because this is what we're breathing. This is what we're drinking. Um, it surrounds us, and I think our environment is already fairly toxic. So as much as we can prevent uh, pollution and make sure that the companies um, are obeying those environmental rules, um, the better off we are. So yes, very important topic, and I think it's very close to, to each, each one of us because we deal with it daily. Of course. Can you explain how a violation might be reported, how it might be discovered and then reported so that, uh, you know, potentially the office uh, gets involved? I understand that our office gets involved further down the line, but could you explain the process further upline to and then kind of explain how our office might get involved? Yes, I will do that. Um, So there are kind of three ways, I would say, how a violation can be discovered. And the first one is the citizen complaint. So if somebody sees something that doesn't look right, maybe you see an excessive flaring at the refinery, which can be really visible, or maybe you see an operation next door to you that is producing excessive dust. All of these things can be reported, and um, the division, the department actually, the, the Department of Environmental Quality has a webpage where you can go to and submit uh, what's called a citizen report, and it kind of breaks it down, tells you different categories of reports that you can submit. And what happens once we receive that report is an inspector from the department is going to address that and go out on an inspection. Um, Depending on what type of report was received, it's going to be either an inspector from a division of air quality, if it's an air complaint, if it's a water complaint, maybe somebody from water quality, and so forth. So that's how the the citizens' uh, complaints are handled. And then the second way is kind of a more formalized way, I would say. And this is the process that we have set up here at the uh, department where each division has an enforcement program, or we usually like to call it a compliance program, where the, the that, that specific section would employ inspectors that go out and inspect inspect sources, um, and I'm going to talk about air pollution because that's what I'm dealing with. So sources of air pollution on a regular basis. And usually the inspection schedule depends on a number of factors. One of them is probably the size of the source. So if the source is a larger source, it's going to be inspected more frequently. If it's a smaller one, uh, probably less frequently because it has less impact on the environment. Uh, another factor would be if a citizen reported something, then the source may be inspected more. And if a source is kind of a more frequent violator and it's maybe on, on our blacklist, then we will go and inspect it more um, as well. So that would be your second way is the regular inspections. And then the, the last one um, is this is for larger facilities like refineries or power plants where these facilities are subject to an 
additional permit, which we call a Title V permit. That permit, in addition to all of your regular requirements, your all, all of your environmental requirements, has a more robust reporting requirements. So for a facility that holds a permit like that, if they have any violation of the permit that they experience, they are supposed to submit a, what's called a deviation report to uh, the Division of Air Quality and uh, let the division know that there is that there is a violation. So this is an additional way of how we we can we can track some of these. So then, how uh, are those? violations resolved? Do the, do the offenders get fined right away? Are they told to go ahead and try to clean it up and then uh, and then the department comes back and re-inspects later? How does that work? Yeah, so there's different levels of, um, I think, compliance that we can see. And again, it depends on the on the size of the source, it depends on how good they are with their environmental compliance. So I'm going to start at kind of the very, <laughs> maybe the, the, the first level. So the first level would be the inspector shows up on site, sees kind of a small violation, like maybe some labels fell off the tanks or something, something that is not that impactful to the environment, but is still required in the rules. And the source may fix it there and then right away, you know, that day. Usually if that happens, we probably wouldn't even formalize it in any way or issue anything written. And there's not going to be any penalty attached to that. But quite often this, this is, this is, not not a very common scenario. So the more common scenario is when the inspector goes on site, sees the violations, and then writes a report saying, "This is what I noticed," and of course tells the tells the source that this is what this is what I observed. And then we issue what is called a compliance advisory or a warning letter, which is uh, a written document, but it doesn't really have a legal force of the order. It doesn't have any appellate rights that attach to it. So it's basically just uh, just letting the source know that there is a violation that was observed and that they should fix it within a certain period of time. Quite often, most sources receive the compliance advisory and they do what they, they're asked to do. And then the division would consider whether they should issue penalties or not. Sometimes there are penalties that, that, that attach if some of the violations were more maybe impactful to the environment, more egregious, then we would have some penalties attached to that. But our, uh, our com- the compliance in Utah generally is pretty good. We were, we were talking earlier, it sounds like people are generally doing the right thing. I think they are, and maybe we should brag about it a little bit. Maybe it's a combined effort of industry and the regulators. So this is the statistics that I have for 2023. The compliance for 2023 was at 94.9%, so almost 95% compliance rate, which is, I mean, which is really high. And then we have less than 1% of the violators that are repeat violators, meaning that people generally, once they commit a violation, they fix it and they don't repeat it. And then only 5% of all the violations go to the formal enforcement process, which I was going to talk about next. Okay. So that's what I was going to ask also is that it sounds like everything we've been talking about, the department kind of handles, if they can, try to get it resolved without without going uh, into the legal process. So when our office gets involved is when you're talking about. When is it that the Attorney General's office needs to get involved with the violation? Right. So the process that I described earlier, the attorney general's office doesn't get involved in. So we don't get involved at the compliance advisory stage. We don't go on inspections. um, So we're not part of that process. But sometimes you have a source that either is not fixing the issues after the inspection, or maybe the violations are so impactful on the environment that we feel like we should be we should be formalizing the process right away. And in those circumstances, the the division of air quality or any other division in the department would issue uh, what's called a notice of violation. And a notice of violation is a more formal document. It even kind of reads like a court pleading. It has specific allegations about what what um, what was observed on site, what the what the violations were. And then it also gives the source an order to uh, remedy the violations by a certain 
some time and then has like a general um, warning about the penalties. So we usually don't include the exact number of penalties in the notice of violation, but we calculate them later and that becomes part of the, usually the settlement process if nobody challenges this notice of violation. And that's another thing to add here is that the notice of violation is a formal legal document that is being reviewed by the Attorney General's office before it goes out to the source because there is an appellate right that attaches. So if the source receives that, they have a right within 30 days to appeal this through our administrative process. So not the the judicial process yet, but the administrative process. Okay. So one notorious example of of our office getting involved is that uh, company up by the Great Salt Lake called U.S. Magnesium formerly known as MagCor, which is uh, which has been identified as one of the top polluters in the in the nation or you know even wider geographical area because of the you know the nature of what they do uh, their air quality violations they're in a difficult situation because it sounds like that process is is difficult but how is that case illustrative of the overall process that we would get involved in it sounds like that one uh, is a good example of what we would do how we would get involved and then how things can go that's correct so this um and this is resolved now so we have a settlement and all the violations have been resolved so and the company's not operating the either. company yeah so i think they're operating I don't, they're operating part of their, part of their plant, but not the magnesium operation. And the magnesium operation is the one that was causing more environmental issues and just things that were happening with, with noncompliance. Okay. But they had stuff going on that, um, that we got involved with Correct. and there was a... So they have, the, the magnesium side of the operation was, was working for, for many, many years. And that's where, when, when the... AG's office got involved. The problem was that there were multiple violations and maybe I can kind of give an illustration of, a, of at least some of those violations to, to just to, to kind of give an example of, of what a kind of a, an impactful violation could be. Sure. So uh, these larger companies um, have specific limits in their permits for different pollutants, and they're not supposed to emit beyond the limit that is put in their permit. And to ensure that they're not emitting uh, beyond that limit or above that limit, they need to do what's called stack testing. So they go out on the site, it usually is an independent contractor or a different company that comes on, on their site and does the stack test to see what are they emitting and if they are you know, staying under their limits. And several violations in the U.S. MAG case were violations of the stack test, meaning that the company was emitting above the limit that is in their permit. And then a couple of other violations were um, violations of the stack test not being performed on time, which is also a problem for the environment because we don't know how they're operating. We don't have that data. So that's an impactful violation. And because of the multiple violations and just the difficulty uh, working with the, with the source, we issued notices of violation to them. And then eventually the case ended up in district court where we litigated the case and came to a settlement with the company. Okay. All right. So that case, that case has been resolved. For now, the magnesium operation itself is is on hold, so everyone can literally breathe easy, I guess, yes, right now. That's right. Okay, okay, so uh, you mentioned earlier about how Utah citizens can get involved. Kind of reiterate what they can do if they if they see something, because I think a lot of people really do want to you know report things if they see it, and they want to they want to be sure that they're doing the right thing. Yes, absolutely. Um, so anybody can Google the Utah. Department of Environmental Quality, and then if you if you land on the website uh, for the department, you can find a, a, a web page there again through the search report a problem or report a spill or report a, a dust violation, and it'll take you to the to the web page that allows you to to submit that. Uh, report. We accept anonymous reports, so if you don't want to provide your personal information, that's that's just fine, and uh, we appreciate those reports. As long 
long as you tell us where to go and, and where the source of the problem is. Okay, cool. How would you say that, you know, you're, you're doing this job and, uh, you know, it sounds like part of your drive in doing this job is that you care about the environment too and you, envi- you care about air quality. So how would you say that uh, tie in what we do with everyone's concern about environmental quality in general, air, water, and land? Well, I think when the companies that are operating in the state know that there is a consistent process and that their operations are being overseen. And if they don't respond or react to the compliance advisory or don't respond or react to the notice of violation, that this will be escalated to a court case, I think most companies are going to listen to that. So that's where I see my role is we have a smaller percentage, right, of a difficult cases. It's only 5% of those that go to formal enforcement. But that's that's the percentage that matters. These are the people that are either deciding we're not going to follow the rules or they just don't have a good process in place sometimes within the company to take care of the environmental concerns. So that's where I think I see the attorney general's office coming in and saying, well, we can help the department take care of the of the five percent and make sure that everybody is operating on a level playing field, right? We don't have one company obeying all the laws and paying the cost of obeying the laws, and then we have another company next door that just says, We're not gonna do anything. Uh we're gonna sit around, we're not gonna pay these for, for additional controls or for processes to make sure that we uh, obey the environmental laws. Um, so I think that's that's another thing is we're creating this level playing field for for the sources. Yeah, the, our, our compliance rate is, is so good because we're here. I mean, if we weren't here, then who knows what might happen. That's right. <laughs> I <All> agree. Right. <laughs> well, this has been very, uh, very educational. Thank you very much for joining us today on Legally Speaking, Marina. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. You're welcome.